like TV. Play some music. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, can people hear me? Uh, I'm yeah. Charlie Krasner. I'm here with Mike Stander, Jessica Thompson, and welcome to the new and improved uh, Echo Antibiotic Stewardship Program. Uh, after five years of doing it the same way, I'm taking a different approach today since, uh, you know, I like preaching to the choir, and most of you guys are infection control and stuff, so we really aim it towards uh, infection control and how taking care of infection control issues will also help with uh, antibiotic stewardship. So, uh, we actually, somebody very nicely, uh, Kristen, uh, contributed a case, and uh, it's a patient who has hep C and uh, TB. I happen to run a hep C clinic, and I also happen to run the TB clinic, so uh, this is right up my alley. So I drum up enough business to get people to participate, so. But I'm always, if everyone has hep C questions, please feel free to ask me. Is there any other cases that anybody wanted to talk about? So the new and improved approach. So I'm gonna pull up some slides. And I think these are issues that uh, antibiotic uh, infection control specialists and uh, should be very interested in. First, there's a, what's the first slide? Let's see if I can figure out how to work this. Okay, there's a thing called the Cochrane Review, and this is a large uh, organization that, what they do is they, they, they get all, they look at a question, how should you, should you do bypass surgery? Should you, What's a, what's a good goal of hypertension? And they do what's called meta-analyses, and they get all the studies that ever written on it, and they have some fancy uh, statistical methods. They look at the quality of it, and they, they try to come to a, a conclusion and say, yes, we recommend this. It's sort of, it's an unbiased, very scientific uh, approach to uh, different questions. And so they just released a meta-analysis of both interventions to improve antibiotic prescribing practices for hospital inpatients. And so they looked at all these studies, and they, they want to see what interventions actually can uh, change prescribing habits for inpatients. And they compared what they call persuasive, you know, uh, education, things like echo programs, computer reminders, say, hey, use bathroom instead of, you know, Cipro for your urinary tract infections. And they compared it with what we call restrictive. When I was a fellow at UC Davis, uh, we had what was called a restricted formulary. They had the fellows, they'd be on call 24-7, so if somebody wanted to, some crazy drug like marijuana at three o'clock in the morning. They wouldn't call the attendant. They'd call the fellow and say, "This is why I want this drug." Okay, and they'd have things like, they, well, they wouldn't even give you a choice of an antibiotic. They'd have automatic stop in three days. So it's persuasive, trying to you know educate people versus just saying no uh, and, and restricting things. Okay, so it'd be like a parent, you know, maybe you should do your homework versus no. Okay, so and they wanted to see did this. How did this affect excessive antibiotic prescribing? Was there one benefit for one for one approach versus the other? And they found them both equally effective in reducing prescribing after six months. But they found that, as you can imagine, persuasive intervention led to better acceptance and enhanced sustainability. Because if you use restrictive methods, it's, you know, it's the antibiotic program versus the doctor. Uh, it just has a bad atmosphere. And secondly, you know, if, if, it, if the antibiotic is not on a formulary, you know, it could take a few hours to get a hold of somebody, get it permitted, and then when you have to get antibiotics going. So there's a lot of reasons probably not to use restrictive approach. And that's what we do at the VA and other hospitals that we, you know, we let people write what they want and then uh, make suggestions and try to adjust it because you don't want to stop. First of all, you want to work as a team and not you versus them. And two, you don't want to have any delay in, in getting treatment. They only showed about a 15% increase in compliance from about 43% to guidelines about 58%. So there was a lot of ways to go, uh, and, but it didn't seem to, uh, it also had a two-day decrease in antibiotic duration, one day short hospital stay, no compromise in patient safety. The studies did not give much information about antibiotic resistance. You know, everybody talks about it, but very few programs would give you any information. So they really couldn't comment whether or not it reduced resistance. One thing they could say, it was definitely a decrease in C. diff transmission in the, in the studies that went over that. So working with the people, not against them, uh, and uh, you'll probably get better compliance and uh, sustain, sustainability of your interactions. And this was a, a study that I found really, it's an older study. It's called Diagnostic Errors That Lead to Inappropriate Antimicrobial Use. So, you know, we have these antibiotic programs 
you know, we say this is how to treat pneumonia, this is how to treat urinary tract infection, this is how to treat cellulitis. And we're going on the assumption that people are making the right diagnosis. Okay, and so if you just have guidelines, but if the, the diagnosis is incorrect, you know, the guidelines don't help at all. So you really have to depend on the on the the position of admitting people, are they making the diagnosis correctly? And so they looked at diagnostics, diagnoses that were used as indications for antibiotics. And only about 60% of the time was antibiotic, was the diagnosis correct when they did a chart review. The ones who are more likely to be correct when they said something like an abscess, intradolomal infection, or community acquired pneumonia. And uh, that was usually more correct, even though they always use the right antibiotics. But when they said things like pyuria, fever, leukocytosis, uh, they were basically not treating a disease, they were treating symptoms, and, uh, and almost never did uh, antibiotic stewardship program guidance help because they, they weren't really treating the disease. And so one of the things that we found helpful with the VA is that we don't just accept their diagnosis. It's a small hospital we're able to walk over and look at the patient and say, you know, is this really cellulitis or is this really just a gout attack? So you know, I think there are limits to a, an antibiotic stewardship program that just has recommendations without you know, uh, some clinical intervention. And then a small hospital there in Northern Nevada, we were, able to, we were able to look at the patients and, uh, you know, just take a second glance and make sure this is the diagnosis that we've been treating this right in the first place. All right. So this is something that gets everybody agitated, infection control uh, 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 nurses particularly. Healthcare workers refusing the influenza vaccine, okay? And what's, what's the outcome of people refusing this? Okay, this was a... A study, this was a summary about three years ago, I'm just showing you, about one third of all healthcare workers uh, don't take the flu vaccine. And as you can imagine, everybody knows, the biggest reason, I just don't want the vaccine, I might get sick from the vaccine, I don't think they work, I may experience side effects, I'm allergic to the vaccine, etc. We all heard all those things. And so, this is, and I think, okay, it's my decision, it's my life, the unions back me up, I don't have to do this, whatever. I can do what I want. So this was a, a study that just came out uh, this month, and it was from uh, Spain. And Spain has a, a computer system that they have the entire country uh, all different diseases. And one of the ones they can do are, is the flu, okay? And they wanted to look at characteristics of patients who got admitted to the intensive care unit from the community with the flu versus those who got admitted to the intensive care unit with hospital-acquired influenza. So how do you know where you got it? So what they did was they looked at patients who were admitted right to the ICU from, you know, from the ER, they had the flu. And then what they did was they looked at patients who were diagnosed with the flu, came with no flu symptoms, and after seven days, so uh, after seven days that they caught the flu and they ended up in the intensive care unit, it had to be healthcare associated, healthcare-acquired infection. They said, if first two days community acquired, after seven days was hospital acquired, the, the, uh, the incubation period of the flu is up to seven days. So if somebody caught, was diagnosed influenza day four or five or six, it might have been hospital acquired, but they couldn't say definitively. So they just wanted to look at those who were community acquired versus those who definitely got in the hospital, okay? It turned out about 10% in their data bank uh, were definitely hospital acquired. And these people ended up in intensive care unit. They wanted to see what happened to these patients. So here's the study. Patients with influenza admitted to the intensive care unit. There was, uh, here is, uh, 2,000 patients were admitted to intensive care unit with influenza in Spain. 2,400. Of them, 2,000, you go next thing down, 2,035 they could evaluate. There were 708 were unclassified because they were between days two and seven, so they could say, is this hospital acquired or possibly a, a delayed community acquired? So community acquired influenza A on the bottom, diagnosed less than 48, then 1,000 patients. Hospital acquired influenza, these are diagnosed after seven days, their symptoms started seven days, and they start treatment. So they went to the ICU. So 10% of their of the hospital, of the patients in Spain got hospital acquired influenza. So this next study, this is what happened, their mortality. So the the red one, the, the blue one on the top was the mortality of patients admitted with community-acquired influenza intensive care units. So they had about, a, after that, uh, down to about 40%, 50% survival of those patients. If you looked at 
patients that acquired it in the hospital, the green one, their mortality, about 80% of the patients died, okay? Obviously, the ones who are getting in the hospital, these are, people come from a community that just have pneumonia, okay, they have the flu. These are patients who oftentimes have cancer, leukemia, diabetes, or in bad shape. So those patients have a remarkable, now you give them the flu, and many of them, most of them are dying, the ones who go into the intensive period. And so I think this is telling you, you know, this is not a joke. If you, you know, if you transmit, you know, before you, you get symptomatic of the flu, you transmit it to somebody, and they end up in intensive care, you know, they have a very good chance of dying. And so it's not just about, oh, I don't want the flu vaccine. It is a sort of an ethical responsibility to make sure that you're not transmitting the flu to patients, to your patients. And this is a significant, over 200 patients had definitively healthcare, uh, hospital-acquired influenza. So that's pretty dramatic. You know, the next time somebody says, oh, I don't want it, then you say you give it to your patients, leukemia, the other patients, they have an 80% mortality of dying in the intensive care unit. Does that make sense? Bad news. All right. So there's some more information just came out on C. diff in the last few weeks. So are we over-isolating and over-treating our patients? So this is available on eBay. It's got the coffee makes me blank, and you can, it has the Bristol School call chart. So you can walk around the hospital and you can look at people's diarrhea and, and, and decide what stage it is because you really you want to stage seven uh, to really have C. diff. So this is a few studies. This was a real interesting one because uh, all the infection control uh, people, you know, they there's so much isolation of C. diff patients. And this was a study out of uh, out of uh, Switzerland, they wanted to look, they called transmissibility of C. diff without contact isolation. Results from a prospective observational study with 451 patients. And this was in Basel, Switzerland. And they, they wanted to know that in the United States, we use contact precautions for all patients with C. diff infection. You know, everybody walks in, needs a gown, uh, gloves, et cetera. In contrast, in this hospital in Switzerland, since 2004, what they have done is only contact precautions, with, contact precautions were discontinued in all patients with C. diff infection unless they had the NAP1 strain or the patients were incontinent, okay? So the majority of patients, uh, they did not, all they had was hand washing and gloves if you're gonna touch the patient, okay? All C. diff infection patients were instead treated by standard precautions, which we do with every patient, right? And they had a dedicated toilet. So what they did was some of these people were in rooms and they had roommates. Some of their, some of their uh, floors had rooms of like two to four people in it. And so they, what they want to do is they say, we got a guy with C. diff. Uh, we don't have them in uh, contact isolation. Or we didn't have them in isolation before they developed C. diff. And so the average person roommate had a five-day exposure to a patient who had C. diff before he was uh, uh, separated out. So all contacts to the index case were screened for toxigenous C. diff by rectal swabs. And then what they did was, if a patient had C. diff in the stool, they did DNA sequencing to see, was this the isolate identical to the roommate, or is this an unrelated isolate? And they then followed the patient in the hospital and after discharge. Did this patient go on to get C. diff in the hospital or after he left? And so this is the study. So index patients, they had, if you go 881 patients who had C. diff in their stool, 750 of them actually had C. diff infection. So these were people who had squirty diarrhea, Bristol stage seven. And they had 493 people who were exposed to them for an average of five days. They then, they then screened all these patients who were roommates only, if you see, 27 of them had C. diff in their stool. The rest, 424, had no C. diff found in their stool. And of those 27 who got exposed to C. diff, only two, of, only six of them of the 27 were actually related to the, the, the patient who was, the, so 750 patients, only six people contact exposures actually got a C. diff from the same one who was a roommate. And of those six, Two got an infection, actually four got an infection with C. diff. Okay, so extremely small risk. And so 
If you look at this is their this is their overall transmissibility of C diff without contact isolation. And this is in their hospital. The red ones show actually nosocomial transmission. The rest were people who came in with it. And you can see very few cases, two, four, six cases total out of hundreds of cases. But their overall C diff rate was going way up. So the next slide shows. These are their conclusions. One, strict attention to standard precautions, gloves and hand washing, plus a dedicated toilet may be very effective means to control C. diff. Very rare to see it transmitted, even with someone who's a roommate there for days. The authors say they have excellent hand hygiene compliance at their facility. They do admit that they have an increasing overall C. diff rate, and they attribute it to lack of an antibiotic stewardship program at their hospital, not to those of transmission. So they need an echo program there. You think a big place like that would have an antibiotic stewardship program? They may have an opening in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, are, so the question, are we, are we going crazy using contact isolation in our patients? You know, when do we take them out of isolation? Do they really need isolation as long as they're content of their stool and don't have that one strain? So you guys have any thoughts on that from the infection control people? Is that, is that something you... Uh, I mean, these people are also isolated, and it's very unpleasant for them, I'm sure. Was the hand hygiene, just, or hand washing, or the hand sanitizer? Their, 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 magazine, their article actually said they were using alcohol. They were. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird. It's like, oh. <laughs> so they might have just been wearing gloves, you know? Anyway, so that was very interesting that uh, even though their C diff rates were going up, it wasn't because of. Uh, 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 those coma transmission is probably just because we're overusing antibiotics. Did they, they, did they just did they discuss, discuss the, the uh, uh, environmental, environmental cleaning just a second that they were using? They did, but I don't remember their details. But I think it was just I remember there's just bleaching and stuff like that. As far, I can't, can't swear they didn't have one of those UV light machines or anything else like that. But it's like, did they wipe the rails down once a day? And I'd have to check that. Yeah. Interesting to see. Yeah. All right. So this is another study that I thought was interesting. You know, we everybody we're all carrying the flag for stool transplants, okay? And they said, oh, let's get stool transplant. This is fantastic. And this was an article just came out on the clinical infection disease this week that uh vancomycin taper regimen, the six week taper regimen, maybe is effective as a stool transplant, okay? And you know, it really brought up a lot of points that, you know, that uh, I was not aware of. So, uh, this is the study I've always been showing, you know, I give a talk on C. diff, and I show, this is how fantastic it is. This is from the New England Journal about three years ago. What you see is, uh, these were patients with recurrent C. diff infections. On the left side, where it says 81 and 93%, these are patients that have recurrent C. diff, and then they'd be given a donor feces infusion, a fecal transplant, 81% got one. If they needed a second one, 93% cure rate. And then you compare it to vancomycin, only had a 30% cure rate. So this is fantastic. Everybody said, oh yeah, this is fantastic. Let's, let's give stool transplants, okay? And so this was a study that just, what they wanted to do was, what they wanted to do in this study was, they, they had 30 recurrent C. diff patients. And when they relapsed, they were randomized. These patients had multiple episodes of C. diff, and they said, as soon as you, as soon as you uh, relapse, come on in, and we will see you, and we'll either give you a six-week uh, six vancomycin taper, 14 days QID, BID. It's a little bit different than usual. QID, BID for a week, once daily, once every other day, then every third day. So it's a six-week taper. The idea is that you get... Uh, the, the body's, uh, you know, uh, microbiome starts healing itself. And they compared it to a patient who, they relapsed, they were given 14 days of vancomycin QID, they waited two days, and then they received a, a fecal transplant enema, okay? So vancomycin taper versus a transplant. And this is the relapse rate, and when they got these results, they said this is a futile study, we're not gonna show that uh, fecal transplant works any better uh, than vancomycin taper. So this was the 30 patients, they had about 15 in each group. You can see after a few weeks, uh, they had a relapse, fecal transplant, they had a 55% relapse rate. 
while the vancomycin taper, they had about a 50% relapse rate. I said, whoa, this doesn't fit with everything that we know, okay? This doesn't fit with the study. And so, this is, then they made some comments. There is no accepted protocol for fecal transplantation or even study. They say, in our study, we waited until the patient relapsed before we, before we gave them the fecal transplant. In this study, what they did was, they were just transplanting, they, they, they put people on uh, the vancomycin, and uh, then they, they gave them, they were on the suppressive therapy, then they gave them the, the school transplant. But they said 60% of patients who are on the vancomycin for extended period of time don't relapse. So what you're doing is you, you may be giving a stool transplant to somebody who's not even gonna relapse in the first place, okay? And said, then they said, you know, in this study, where they had the big relapse, in this one, fecal transplant, they were giving people 14 days of vancomycin, waiting two days, and then they were giving the stool transplants. But possibly what was happening was the vancomycin was hanging around because there's like five days in the stool, and it might have wiped out the gut for the fecal transplant. So there are so many questions. There's no like, this is how we do fecal transplant. You know, is it oral? Is it fresh, frozen, colonoscopy, NG2? What is it, patient on suppressive therapy versus an acute infection like they did in this study? This study only used acute infection. So if you use people on suppressive therapy, you, you may stop the suppressive therapy and you won't even come back, okay? This, these patients were pre-treated with vancomycin before the, the, the fecal transplant, which may have negatively affected the stool transplant. And so you can't just say, oh, fecal transplants are better than a vancomycin taper, okay? I said, that study, the one that looks great in the journal, they may have only treated those people for two weeks of vanco, okay? This one was six weeks. They may have, uh, uh, you know, waited to the people, this one waited to the relapse. They may have done that while they were still negative, okay? So there's so many different approaches. So this really says, you know, maybe we don't go, have to go so crazy with fecal transplants because uh, a vancomycin taper in these patients who relapse, almost 50% of them were cured. And the other question is, you know, I'm gonna present a case right now. Of, oftentimes these patients who, quote, relapse in these studies, this whole idea that you get irritable bowel syndrome after you're getting vancomycin treatment, okay? It can really, there's no, say, oh, this patient's relapsed in diarrhea. They're oftentimes just giving fecal transplant. It may just be irritable bowel syndrome. So there's so many factors, and, and you just have to, you know, say, look at this study. How are they doing it? You know, there's no real, there's no real uh, definitive approach. That's why, you know, the FDA has not approved fecal transplants, but all these questions are still being answered. But don't, don't accept it as a, uh, no question that fecal transplant is better. Can I comment on that? Yeah. So I totally agree. There's nothing saying fecal transplant is better than a prolonged taper. Right. Than a oral vancomycin. I totally agree. You should try a prolonged oral vanco taper before you go to the fecal transplant route. But the, it's, I think it's interesting how they administered the fecal transplant by enema uh -huh. versus what I think the majority of our community is doing, which is either a colonoscopy or by uh, through endoscopy, okay, and you know to get the whole colon involved versus just the distal, the distal portion of the colon, which I, I I don't again no study comparing one method or protocol over another, but it would make more sense for uh, you know uh, endoscopy or colonoscopy to be more effective than an enema. Which I'm curious to see. I forgot to see who actually administered those enemas too. And I hear, here, are they waiting for a relapse, or they just treat people on suppressive therapy? Uh, it depends on which GI group, from my understanding. Uh, I think one particular group took after the end of treatment, but whether or not they did two weeks of treatment or pedoxamycin or prolonged taper, it's always at the end of treatment. The other group, it's uh, it's they'll do it before they complete treatment, okay. but they, they they but they don't continue those antibiotics after the transplant. Yeah. But he said, you know. Some of these sixty percent in some of these states, these patients don't relapse after a bank. Yeah, I think that's probably some of the best data we have on the relapse after a bank of taper. Yeah, there's just not a lot of information out there. Yeah, that's, you know that's one thing that when I was a real pharmacist um, <laughs> that it concerned me about. You know, at, at renowned people were using five hundred milligrams four times a day, or two fifty milligrams four times a day. A bank of of Vanco. And you even mentioned, you know, paper history of uh, CDF, and they started an antibiotic, you're going to use 125 BID. And 
uh, my comment was, I'm not sure, since you get such high levels in the gut, that we're still using too much. That's, we just have the studies. How do we know that if you didn't do four, uh, uh, two weeks of antibiotics and then put them on a taper period for a while, it wouldn't do just as good or better? Yes, that's why there's nothing. There's no I mean, why do we need the, the go down to twice a day, then once a day, then every other day? You know, I mean, uh, we have no information. It's yeah. just the way things are done. It's tradition. It's tradition, exactly. <laughs> but that's why, you know, it's really interesting to show that when they gave uh, antibiotic, uh, the transplant within two days, or two days after the stopping the antibiotics, there was problems, and that makes sense to me, yeah. because you, you have to get that vancomycin out of there. Yeah, so it probably wiped out the stool. Floor. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So one of our listeners said, perhaps when an acute care facility decides to do away with contact isolation for C. diff patients, this acts to signal, signal the staff that perhaps they are studying isolation and its effectiveness in the study group and presents bias to the study. It could be a bias study. Uh, you know, one of the concerns they, they talk about in uh, uh, doing this is that, uh, you know, people may get lazy and uh, won't wash their hands as carefully and stuff like that. And so, you know, they say it's not, it's not a free lunch if you stop uh, the contact isolation. But don't you still have to worry about Jayco and all the... Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's something to keep in mind, you know, we go crazy about it. And, you know, like, like what, you know, after we've treated somebody for C. diff, do we take them out of isolation? Do we leave them there for the whole hospitalization? Yeah. This would certainly suggest that you don't need to, just, just have people wash their hands and wear a glove. Wear a glove like my wife does. <laughs> Do you want any of the hospitals take the people out of isolation that went, uh, after a few days of C. diff treatment or leave them there for the whole hospitalization? We take, we take them out, out after 48 hours, hours of no, no signs. No diarrhea? Right. Uh, what do you do, Beth? We, uh, we <laughs> And when they make a stool. Forms. Oh, stool. Yes. I want to show, uh, we'll get to later, but I, want to, I have a, uh, just remember, C. difficulitis is, 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 is a clinical diagnosis that is only confirmed by lab tests. It's not simply a positive lab test, okay? It's a, it's a diagnosis of infection, and it's, the diagnosis is watery diarrhea, which is the bristle seven, which is on the bottom of that cup. It's watery diarrhea is the cardinal symptom of C. diff infection. And you have to have multiple bowel movements in 24 hours. can be accompanied by abdominal pain, cramping, fever, nausea, anorexia, and leukocytosis. So it's not a, a C. diff, it's not a positive PCR test. A PCR test is just picking up the presence of C. diff, which has the potential to produce the toxin. And most people, if you, you, they have, most people are asymptomatic from the C. diff. And so the C. diff test is extremely sensitive. The PCR test will pick up all C. diff, but it's not very specific for the disease because, uh, just because of the expert on that, but many of these patients are on things like laxatives, uh, right, feedings. That's, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Very common. Very common. Multiple. Stools openers, laxatives, uh, yeah, d definitely two feeds. Yeah, so, you know, they, they walk in the hospital, they put on this regimen, they get diarrhea, you know, the nurse or the doctor orders a C. diff test, it comes back positive. Okay, so that is not C. diff infection, that is a carrier state, okay? And they should, they should really not be even testing those stools that are, unless they're pure watery, you know, everybody knows what C. diff stool looks like, it's watery, okay? And so your, your micro lab should be blocking, they should say, we're not going to do this. Okay, let me show. Uh, this was a this was a case I had a few years ago. I'm gonna give these. I'll skip the. This is a lady I was referred to about two years ago. She's a 53 year old woman. She has had extensive uncom uncomplicated plastic surgery. A lot of procedures done, and the doctor normally keeps her in the hospital. It's downtown Reno, but I won't say the name. Uh, and so. <laughs> So she was kept overnight. There was no room in the hospital, so they put her in the, in the ICU for the night, okay? And uh, so she goes home the next day, and for whatever reason, he puts her on Keflex for a few days after the surgery. So a week later, she had profuse watery diarrhea, 
See if PCR was positive, okay? That fits, watery diarrhea of antibiotics. She was given fragile for 10 days and diarrhea resolves. So he, he sent her for a follow-up C. diff test to confirm the cure. It was still PCR positive. He gave her a prescription for vancomycin, 125 milligrams QID for 10 days. She takes it. She has no symptoms at all. So he does, he does another follow-up test. The PCR is still positive, and he gives her a prescription for Banco, 500 QID. You know, Banco generic capsules are outrageously expensive. So the pharmacy wanted $2,000, and so he got an ID consult. Okay, again, I clinical uh, C. difficile infection is a is a is a, is a disease is a is a presentation of diarrhea and stuff. It's not a lab test, okay? This is where, again, this is very obvious, but again, you know, they're, they're, test, they're treating the PCR positive test, okay, and not treating the patient, okay? So you should have carrier. Most people, even after they get cured of C. diff infection clinically, many of them remain carriers for a long time, okay? Don't do it, don't do a uh, test of cure. And this is the case, I'm gonna give you the last case. This was from uh, JAMA. General AMA, and this was a, they were just talking about C. diff, and this was a, a really interesting case. This is a 28-year-old male who presented with abdominal pain and diarrhea, had greater than 10 bristol type 7 stools, so the watery stools, so he fit the criteria. He was, after a course of augmented for pneumonia. He was diagnosed with C. diff infection by the PCR test, positive for the toxin B gene. So that PCR is picking up C. diff that has the gene which can produce the toxin. It doesn't tell you it's producing the toxin, but we know clinically that he has C. diff, right? Watery diarrhea, double pain diarrhea. He got 10 days of flagell. His symptoms resolved. He returned to baseline two to three bowel wounds a day of type four stool, which is just sort of uh, soft stools, okay? Uh, that was his baseline. Six weeks later, however, he started having more abdominal discomfort relieved by bowel movements with increased stool frequency. Now he's having four to five bowel movements a day, but the stool looked the same. It wasn't the type seven. Physical exam showed a soft abdomen, white count was normal, and repeat stool test for the C. diff toxin. PCR was again positive. What would you do next? One, would you diagnose recurrent C. diff infection and prescribe another course of flagell? Two, diagnose severe C. diff infection and prescribe oral vancomycin because he had failed flagell twice. Diagnose refractory C. diff infection, consider a fecal stool transplant. For diagnosed post infectious altered bowel habits with C. diff colonization, recommend a high fiber diet. Number four. Very good. All right. But a lot of times, patients like that, one, they'd, get, they'd be given either flagell or banco, or they'd be referred for fecal stool transplant. They say this guy's having recurrent stools, okay? And this article talks about. Uh, but 25% of patients who are treated for C. diff will have altered bowel habits, and it can go on for an extended period of time, like an irritable bowel, okay? And without the watery diarrhea, uh, he should, one, not have been tested for PCR, but two, should just been reassured and had him put on a high fiber diet. All right, so, so in summary, C. diff, we may be over, we may be over uh, isolating, patients, and we were definitely over-treating the patients. And then, uh, you know, I think that study of the ICU patients with great mortality, you know, you really want to reinforce with your uh, health care workers that it's not just you that you're helping, but you need to protect your patients. Okay, and the other thing is that antibiotic stewardship programs, it's better to be, have a smile and educational than restrictive and nasty to the thing. What was the last? Oh yeah, and it, you know, if they got the diagnosis wrong, no anybody knows your program in the world's gonna help them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Any questions or comments or? Uh, I have I two have comments. comments. Yes. One, well, thanks, thanks for the for data, data about the flu vaccine. vaccine. Yes. That's, that's, that's a really, really nice, nice study. study. Yes. And, and the other the one, one is, is about, there's, there's been a lot of controversy, controversy about the 30 day, or, or as long as they're in the hospital, hospital keeping them in isolation for C. diff patients. patients. So, so I, I like that, that uh, uh, last study she showed too. too. Yeah, so people just need to wash their hands and wear gloves. Right, if it was, was only that easy. easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Next month's uh, clinic will be March Thursday, March 16th. Hope to see you there. I won't be here.
I'm sorry. Oh, I said, would any.